feel at home because um, you should feel at home because you are at home. Um, just for a uh, piece of housekeeping, the restroom is back behind you because you bring those going out the hallway to the left you'll find the restroom is set up the So um, again, you feel, feel, feel welcome. Of course, um, the refreshments back on the wall, the breakfast sessions, you can get up and feel comfortable Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. I'm actually, I think I'm getting on camera. Right back here, if that's okay with you guys. Great. Good morning again. Uh, my name is Chris Hardy. I know a good number of you folks here uh, across Eastern North Carolina. I know a lot of you politically through the party, but that is not the role I'm in today. Um, I serve as the regional director for Congressman Don Davis, covering all the counties in Eastern North Carolina, most of which are here in the center group. And I'm here because he wants to be here. He wants to make sure your voices are heard, that the organizations you represent 
had a voice to him, either directly or through me. Um, he can't be everywhere. There's 19 counties in this district. And with the voting schedule in the House in Washington, it's tough to get home. I'll give you a prime example. Thursday night, they started the vote on the National Defense Authorization Act at 10 p.m. Let me say at 10 p.m. They didn't finish too well after midnight and didn't get home until late yesterday. So I'm here today. But do understand that our office, which is based in Greenville, is open, receptive. Um, if there's something you need, you can call us directly. I'm going to leave my card for you, Mr. President. So if anybody needs one, you can get me directly. My cell phone is on that card. So if you have issues or something your town or your community needs or your organization needs, please reach out to our office. And do know that Congressman Davis is very open and very receptive because we need to make sure all voices are heard across this district, um, not just the ones in some of the larger metropolitan areas. Thank you, Mr. President. Of course, you know, people didn't like that. And 
Things were put in order that made it much harder. And these are thriving times for our people. In the 1860s and 1870s, So I told Diane, I said, well, the, when hearing that, it was in the 1970s that Grover got his first black council person. And I, and I said, well, we then moved into the land. So as, as my generation growing up, I told her, we've seen the best of times that we could get jobs, good jobs. That they, they, we could get education. We were not denied of being able to eat in restaurants because of the color of our skin. A woman had the right to choose what she wanted to do with her body. And now, in 2023, the rights that my wife had, my children don't have anymore. And she thought about that and she said, you know what, I, I hadn't thought about that. And to bring this story to a close, a few years ago, I heard attorney Peter Green give a, a great synopsis from Reconstruction to Jim Crow 1, Jim Crow 2, the Civil Rights Movement, to where we are today. So I've asked the attorney Peter Greer, he's online, I've asked him would he give us that history lesson today, because it is something that we we forget. And if we're ready, uh, we would we would be able to listen to attorney Peter Greer, the owner of the Greater Diversity Newspaper in Wilmington give us, I'm going to call it the history lesson. Attorney Greer, hold tight.
not like you. And, 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 and in making this statement, I'll say that there was no thing that a white person in America was born. Black people came into existence when the Europeans decided that they needed to enslave black people so that they could get the free labor that they wanted, but that they didn't want to enslave their own kind. So they named their own kind white people and named the slave black people. And then they constructed the whole legal system that pretty much put black people into enslavement and maintained us, our forefathers in enslavement until the Civil War, which took place between 1860 and 1865. And, 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 and after the Civil War, there were laws passed. And, and we've always been challenged by laws. And the laws that had been most bearing on black people were the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Those were laws that free slave gave black people citizenship and the right to vote. And immediately after the Civil War, we saw Southerners had been conquered. The Congress was really controlled by Republicans. And back right after the Civil War, the Civil War, the Republicans were in the party that objected to slavery. Those are not today's Republicans. The words may sound the same, but uh, the, Democrat, the, the uh, Democrats during the Civil War would be the same as the what happens with the Republicans of today. And, and, and so, immediately after the Civil War, the black people had no land, no money, no institution. There was a decision made to try and give for the black people the basic of life. Some way to, to feed, clothe, and shelter themselves. And so the government established the Freedmen's Bureau that supposedly was to help black people rise up from their slave past and become self-sufficient. And so Let's say between, and my, my, my day comes, I'm not going to try to make them specific because I can't keep them straight in my mind, but between 1865 and 1877, the, yeah. Free, the Freedmen's Bureau was in charge of protecting the rights of recently free slaves. And the period of time that that they were in charge up to 1877 was known as the first new construction. And, it, and, and this is the first chance that America had to help black people become self sufficient. That's going up. And uh, someone has the mic on. Please give me mic if you will turn it off. And, and so. Um, between 1865 and 1877, when black people were uh, gaining their citizenship and the right to vote, they began reading, which is number one on their list, and building communities, schools, stores, businesses, farms. Um, they were doing lots and lots and lots of things that were making them independent of their previous white now, and in a lot of places, white people hate it. 
They didn't want to see black people prosper in any way. And so, uh, after years and years, I should say years and years, because it's only maybe 10 to 12 years, maybe less, that black people had these kinds of rights before white folk uh, got the union to pull the soldiers out. The soldiers were in the South, all over the South, and working, forcing laws that protected black people. And um, after the soldiers looked through that took 1877, white people began killing, doing everything imaginable to black folks. Hanging, KKK, burning buildings, burning churches, burning down businesses, everything that white people do to intimidate black people and prevent them from getting ahead, they did. So, 1877 would mark the end of the first reconstruction of the poor first period of time after the Civil War that black people were in a position to make some legitimate progress. And they made it, black folk were jealous, and they did everything in their power, and they took it back. So, so the next uh, reconstruction stop, that's like 1877, 1878, and it lasted for um, almost, and my numbers I want to be all, uh, but that's been between 75 to 85 years, more or less. And, and my numbers are all because you can pretty much tell when it started, the start of young people was at the end of the first reconstruction. And Jim Crow was the era of three times of legal segregation. And that was when uh, all of the country laws were passed to make black folk second class citizens. And so uh, from 1877, I worked at 1954, these segregation laws ruled the day. And they were really the law of the land until 1954 when the Brown was in the of his case was decided. And from 1954, let's say until 1954, 1965, we were in a period of the civil rights movement. And that's where black people fought and died trying to gain the freedom that uh, they were entitled to do. after the Brown and, and 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 so at the end in, in, in 1964 the Civil Rights Act was passed and then in 1965 the Voting Rights Act was passed and Really, between, let's say from the time of the Border Rights Act up until and, and there's no specific date on this, up until today, that's been maybe, maybe, uh, I'm, I'm going to say 2013 when Shelby County had the, uh, one of the amendments of the Border Rights Act declared unconstitutional. And that would have been 2013. But from 2013, more or less, now these are not exactly, but you need to know what's going on. So, so black people have made much progress between 1954 and 2013.
but it was my last time that was. Um, but at the, at the end of 2013, after the civil rights act, the board of rights act, when, when the board of rights act was so apparent, we ended what is commonly called the third reason itself. And it's almost like here we go again, all of the trials that we made on this civil rights movement was taken away in the Seattle decision. And not all of it, but a lot of the rights that began with the civil rights movement were taken away during the end of the trial. But the Seattle decision. Um, so what, what, what we come to consider the end of the civil rights movement led us into the third reconstruction. And that's where we are today, where we're called upon to fight again for basic human rights and decency that all human beings should be entitled to. And with that, I'm going to go into my next area of activism. I was active during the Civil Rights Movement. I was a student at Fayetteville State during the marches and a lot of, a lot of other things. And uh, so I've witnessed during my lifetime the gaining uh, of rights and have those same rights taken away. But since uh, the Third Reconstruction over the last 10 years, Black people are never going to accept such a black citizen. And so, even though we've always had the price of what true rights we were able to attain, we always fall. And, and, and the nature of our struggle has changed from time to time, but we were always in the struggle. And we are in a struggle on time. And when the third reason stressed, but all of us know that times have changed. And the way we fight today is different from the way we fought during the Jim Crow, which was the different from the way we fought and resisted during slavery. And so today, I, I just want to introduce you all to uh, what I'm doing that I think Black people, because I'm, in, I'm involved in the worldwide movement for black liberation, black people not liberation. And, and, and our enslavement and, and uh, exploitation has always been because of economics. We became slaves because of economics. Black people became white because of economics. So, I put into the chat the name of a book, and I'm going to hold it up to the camera. Uh, some of you can see it, maybe others can't. But the name of the book is From Ghetto to Community by Billy F. Sand, and it was published in 2001. It is one of the most informative books. It's 100 and, uh, it's 146 pages. And it's one of the most informative books that I have ever read. And it's good and easy reading. But it's the read that, that, that we have to make today. parity, economic liberation, and, and general freedom for black people. And, uh, I'm going to give a quick overview of how we're dealing with this. That's all the other money, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. A couple of weeks ago, I was really shocked. I had never heard anything like it before in my life. Well, it's 20 years old, so 
I had to do the years when it first came out, and I didn't hear anybody report on it. But, but the basic notion of the book is very, very simple. And, and what, this, what this person said is black people in America are trying to achieve economic liberation, parity, freedom through white institutions. And it will never happen. White institutions were created to protect and promote white culture. And try it as we may, as long as we're black, we're not going to be able to go into those institutions that achieve, achieve anything except some individual success, but you're not going to achieve community success. And what, what, what a good man says is, that the black people want to have real opportunity. And the way that they get is through the building of black institutions. And the only two semi-viable black institutions, major institutions in, in the world today, one of them is the black church. That was the first uh, institution that was born out of our uh, history of being here in America. And the other institutions of significance are uh, HBCU, the structure of black colleges and universities. And of course, they were born to educate uh, black people to do uh, service uh, after the Civil War. Now, uh, I've told many of you, and I, I'll, I'll say it again, I'm involved in the African Diaspora Development Center. The North Carolina Chairman of the African Diaspora Development Center. And our goal is to achieve economic liberation in Africa and worldwide. And I would urge group black person in here to, to go to, and I'll put this in, in the chat also, and register and be home now, but you can do it for free if you have the money that you can do it, then do that. But uh, let me type the uh, addressing here, and I'm, I'm, I'm almost done. So, what, when I, when I started reading uh, the book, after 25 pages, it dawned on me, I, I said to myself, to every black person that I know of needs to be reading this book. When I joined ABDI, I found out what it was all about. I said, every black person that I know should be a member of ABDI. And it's, and it's important to understand how these two items go together, how these two things go together. Our ABDI is a worldwide movement calling black people back to Africa. And of course I'm not going back to Africa, but I'm concerned about helping to achieve the economic liberation of Africa because it will be a kid. Black people that have been exploited for all of these centuries and centuries and centuries. And so, other thing that, that sort of occurred to me when I was reading this book from ghetto community was that the black folks deal with institutions. That's the only thing on three black folks. You have to have stuff that you can control that you want to use those kind of instruments to achieve freedom and equality that, that you see as a black people. But the only way that black people can, can uh, I see the only way. But the best way for black people to, to build their own institutions is to take control of the vast, vast, vast wealth of Africa. And that's what ABDI is all about. ABDI was started by uh, Dr. Eric Connor, Chief Town Boy, Quiet. 
do a, I'll do a, a special for you if you text me your uh, phone number and address again I will send you a complimentary book and invite you to, to help us start using this book to live with black people. Okay, we'll do. We'll do what you want. Thanks again. So when you got the email announcing this meeting, there was a survey attached to the email. So I just want to go over the results of the survey. And then was, should the United States raise taxes on people who make more than $400,000? 94% said yes, 5% said no. Do you support legalization of marijuana? 20% said no, 37% said maybe, 43% said yes. Should the federal government increase funding of health care for low-income individuals? 88% said yes, 5.6% said maybe, and I didn't get a reading for the numbers, but you can see it was minimal. Do you support the Affordable Health Care Act? 97% said yes, uh, the 2.9% said maybe. Should people be required to work in order to receive Medicaid? Medicaid. 73%, okay, it was, People should be required to work in order to receive Medicaid. 34% disagreed with that statement. 17% agreed with that statement. 6% strongly agreed with that statement. Should the government regulate social media sites as a means to present fake news and misinformation. 61% of the survey participants said yes, 23% said they were neutral, and 14% said no. Should there be more restrictions on the current process of purchasing a gun? 100% of the survey participants said yes. Teachers should be allowed to carry guns at school. 59% disagreed with that statement. 29% strongly disagreed with that statement. 5% agreed with that statement. Should the victims of gun violence be allowed to sue firearm dealers and manufacturers? 63% said yes, 17% said no, 11% said maybe, someone said if so, illegally, someone else said especially when it involves under 18 and documented mental illness. Should people on the no-fly list be banned from purchasing guns and ammunition? 79% said yes, 21% said maybe. I support affirmative action programs. 70% strongly agreed, 30% agreed. Should rejoin congressional districts be controlled by an independent, nonpartisan commission? 68% said yes. 26%, 27% said no. If found guilty, should former President Trump be pardoned for mishandling classified documents? 100% of the participants said no. Funding for local police departments should be redirected to social and community-based programs. 56% disagree, 20% agree, 11%
strongly agree and 12% strongly disagree. Should police departments be allowed to use military grade equipment? 51% said no, 42% said maybe, 5% said yes. Do you support qualified immunity for police officers? 85% said no, 15% said maybe. Should convicted criminals that have served their time have the right to vote? 86% said yes, 14% said maybe. Do you support mandatory minimum prison sentences for people charged with drug possession? 53% said no, 12% said they, they were neutral on the matter, and 22% said yes. What is your stance on abortion? 91% were pro-choice, 8% were pro-life. Should health insurance providers be required to offer free birth control? 57% said yes, 17% said no, 25% said no. Do you support the death penalty? 44% said no, 32% said yes, 23% said no. Could you repeat those? Uh, do you support the death penalty? 44% said no, 32% said yes, 23% were neutral. Should racial sensitive training be required for employees? Now I'm making a comment about this. This is what's going on now with our Congress. With uh, the military, them holding the promotion of officers. This is one of the things. Should racial sensitive training be required for employees? The participants of our survey said 85 86% said yes. 14% said me. Should the federal government pay for tuition at four-year colleges and universities? 49% said yes, 20% said no, 31% said me. Do you support increasing taxes for the rich in order to reduce interest rates for student loans? 63% said yes, 8% said no, 28% were neutral. Do you agree with the Supreme Court's decision on the student loan forgiveness program? 71% said no, 17% were neutral, 11% said yes. Do you support charter schools? 59% said no, 23%, 24% said maybe, 17% said yes. Should the federal government fund universal free school. 83% said yes, 14% said maybe. Should the government raise the federal minimum wage? 100% of the participants said yes. Should employees be required to pay men and women the same salary for the same job? 83% said yes. 83% said they strongly agreed. 17% said they agreed. So 100% said it should be, they should receive the same. Should the United States raise or lower the tax rate for corporations? 79% said raise. 18% said leave it as is. Welfare recipients should be tested for drugs. 14% said they strongly agreed. 29% said they agreed. 44% said they disagreed. Should the government make cuts to public spending in order to reduce the national debt? 
72% of the participants, 73% of the participants said no, 18% said yes. Businesses should be required to provide paid leave for full-time employees during the birth of a child or a sick family member. 61%, 62% of the participants said yes, they strongly agreed, 35% Agreed. Should there be fewer or more restrictions on current welfare benefits? 42% said they were unsure. 34% said fewer. 22% said more. And that was the conclusion of our survey. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to come up with values. We're going to work on this of values, not only of the civic group, but values that we're going to be looking for in elected officials and candidates for offices. And that's going to be explained later by our political action committee, but we're going to do report calls. We want to do report cards on candidates for positions. And it will be based on the values that we come up with in our upcoming meeting. But today is going to be the first step of doing that. I used to always say, tell people to vote, to get out to vote. But I think now we got to add something to get out to vote. We got to add, get out to vote, and vote for the right person. So at this point, I'm going to, we got out of step with our agenda, but I'm going to ask Ms. Selby if she will come give us a roll call and give us our minutes. And then after that, we will, I will introduce the Political Action Committee, and they will begin to make their presentation.